Is George Floyd more influential in, to American history than Martin Luther King Jr.? I say yes. A terror attack in Texas proves that we live under a corrupt regime. And Ted Cruz redeems himself. This is Gene, and you're listening to Dumbasses Talking Politics. Hey, hey, this is Gene. Welcome back to Dumbasses Talking Politics. Now, you may notice something. It's on a little quieter. There's kind of an echo in the background. That's because I am recording live from Josie's apartment. Actually, I'm not live. This is pre-recorded. I'm recording, but you're not hearing me live or anything. Yes, we all have come down with COVID. So, yay. Um, so, I've got half the family in bed right now. I can't record this in a place with better sound or anything like that. But it is going to be something we're just going to have to deal with for, with me for maybe the next five days or so. Um, good news is I'm probably going to be left alone except for the dog who I'm expecting will come and start whining about something. But let me tell you something. Uh, we went to Big Bear and of course I don't catch COVID for the two years it's been out there. But the second we go to Big Bear, boom, I get it. That's because Josie's daughter got it and then Josie got it and then Josie's other daughter got it. So everyone's COVID friendly. Yay, yay. Spent the day yesterday trying to find COVID tests just so that we could test ourselves. And mind you, none of us are dying, but it's, I mean, they're miserable. It's its a pretty miserable disease or everything, but um, we're not dying or anything. We just, you know, we got COVID. What are, what are we going to do? We're actually kind of thrilled about it because now, outside the fact that kids can't go to school for, you know, I don't know, 72, 76 days or something, it's really not that bad head cold, headaches, congestion, coughing, sneezing. Does that sound familiar? Maybe a temperature? Not necessarily a fever, but maybe a temperature. And I think I I, I do want to point this out while we talk about the temperature thing. Um, You know, we can create COVID vaccines. We can create COVID treatments, we can create a COVID test that you can take home so you can stuff a stick up your nose and and find out whether you're positive or not. But we can't seem to get a thermometer that reads temperature correctly. Josie's daughter, I mean, her temperature was between, I kid you not, 94 degrees and 115 degrees. It just, we got one of those thermometers that you put on the, the temple. And for some reason, Josie, every time she takes the temperature, the kid's temperature is 106. And I, she keeps saying, oh, my gosh, she's got a fever. No, she doesn't have a fever. And then I put it on there, maybe because I know where the, the temple is. And Josie's not here. So she'd be giving me crap if, if I, she heard me say this. But I put it on the thing and it comes up, okay, kid's got a 99.4 temperature. All right. You know. But anyway, it's not so bad. And we are free is clear. Now, that didn't help a trip to Big Bear. Um, that did suck. Got up there. I was sick as a dog in Big Bear. Josie got sick as a dog on Friday, Saturday night. Uh, the drive back sucked. And we'd been planning this trip for over a month, and then we get up there and we're all sick. That kind of sucked. Didn't stop anyone from skiing or anything and building snowmen or whatever we do with the snow, doing snow angel thing, going down the sledding. But it did kind of, it did kind of, you know, put a damper on things. And I did burn myself when I started a fire with the gas. I lost half my eyebrows. Probably not going to be doing a uh, video cast in the near future until my eyebrows go bright. Okay, that's a lie. I'm going to do one later today. But anyway, let's get, let's get to the, uh, let's get to the, the news. So, um, while I was in Big Bear and dying of the China virus, one of the reasons why we were in Big Bear was Martin Luther King's birthday. So I decided to enjoy Martin Luther King's birthday, acknowledge his birthday, enjoy the fact that there was no traffic on the roads. Um, Didn't enjoy the crowds up there. I mean, everybody and their mother must be celebrating Martin Luther King Day by going into the snow, uh, which makes sense considering, you know, Martin Luther King was from the South and there's nothing like snow in the South. Anyway, uh, I didn't watch much news as I tend not to do on the holidays. So I come home and I hear one of the most insane statements from Joe Biden while he's, quote, celebrating 
uh, Martin Luther King Day. And I couldn't believe he actually said that. And, you know, honestly, I wonder if he actually believes he said it. So this is what he said. It's a very short clip. But even Dr. King's assassination did not have the worldwide impact that George Floyd's mm -hmm. death did. Now, I'll tell you, you could, watching him speak, you could see the wheels in his brain turning. Because you know that brain sent out a red flag saying, probably not the smartest thing to say. This is a really dumb thing to say. The problem is Joe Biden's brain works so late, so slowly. He got the sentence out and his brain, you could even tell, it was a, oh shoot, um, too late. I can't stop it. It's over. Now, let's go over the obvious. There's some stark differences between Martin Luther King Jr. and George Floyd. MLK had a doctorate degree in theology from Boston University. Um, George Floyd was a rapper known as Big Floyd from a rap group called Screwed Up Click. So there, there's that difference. MLK fought for civil rights for black people during the Jim Crow era. George Floyd spent time in prison for drug possession and armed robbery. So there, there's that. MLK died because he pushed the passing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and basically forced LBJ, who was a an ardent racist, to sign this bill and push this bill so it can um, so blacks could have the same uh, rights under the law that white people had. Um, George Floyd died because he was stoned on a lethal cocktail of drugs and gave a fake twenty dollar bill to buy some cigarettes. And a bad cop killed him. So there, there's, there are some minor differences between the two. But does it sound like this George Floyd character is the same as Martin Luther King? Why in God's name would Joe Biden say this? There, now, here's the thing. I, and this is weird. I'm going to kind of defend George, Joe Biden because I think he did actually mean what he said. I think he does believe in what he said. And I'll give you a step further. I think most of the left believes exactly what he said. We had always talked about that eventually uh, Martin Luther King was going to be demonized by the left. And even though they haven't quite gotten there yet, they are warming up to it. Now, to start off is start off with, let, let's call it, Joe Biden is stupid and always says the wrong things. He always does this. And I'm not so sure this wasn't one of those times. And let's make it very clear, and I've mentioned this before, Joe Biden is a racist. Anyone who tells you he's not a racist, they're just lying to you. He has gone through his entire political career making racist comments. He was friends with a bunch of segregationists back in the 70s and 80s. He eulogized a, a grand cyclops of the KKK. This is not, he is a racist. Okay, and I'm pretty sure, but I'm pretty sure this was not something he meant to say. Most people in today's society know Joe, uh, George Floyd's criminal career. They know he's a thug. They know he's a criminal. This comment is not going to sit well with anyone outside the minority of the BLM crowd, the Black Lives Matter crowd. They're the ones that are going to completely agree with Joe Biden. But George Floyd's life is a representation of what the left wants this country to be. George Floyd's death, I would say, I would say while tragic, but I don't think it's tragic. I think Joe, George Floyd was going to die anyway. George Floyd was going was was going to OD that day. We know this from the Derek Chauvin trial. Derek Chauvin, who is a crappy human being and cop, if if the reports are correct, he just sped up George Floyd's death. But George Floyd's death did transform the country into something the left has been wanting since the 1960s. He didn't mean to do it, but his death was used by the left. The only thing George Floyd wanted to do was steal a pack of cigarettes while he was really stoned. That, I mean, that's all it was. He did not go out there to be like Martin Luther King, a civil rights leader. But his death was a sacrifice for the left. 
that would over that is now overturning 250 years of the American experiment. That's what happened. His death, George Floyd's death, ended up being an excuse to eliminate the nuclear family, eliminate the Constitution, overturn and change all of the American institutions, eliminate free speech, the free press, religion, and guns, eliminate capitalism, reboot segregation into a view that is that of Black Lives Matter. Demonize white people. Implement, implement critical race theory in schools to children, to teach children what they want the children to learn. Defund the police. Clear the prisons. Legalize crime. Everything that the left has been wanting to do for the last 70, 60 years, they are now doing because of the je- death of George Floyd. And because... George Floyd's death is affecting how the United States is operating. George Floyd's death and the United States affects how the entire world economy, the entire world social order comes to pass, comes to be. George Floyd's death is affecting the entire world. Joe Biden is completely correct. I mean, Martin Luther King, yeah, he did some great things. But Martin Luther King did not follow the same leftist narrative. Martin Luther King believed in the United States. Martin Luther King believed in the Constitution. He just believed that with Jim Crow, we weren't living up to our own ideals. And we needed to change the law so that we could live under those his own ideals. The, the I have a dream speech. Let's not look at the color of a man's skin, but the content of a man's character. In other words, blacks and whites should be able to live together. That's really what he pushed. And the, under the law, blacks, whites, and any person of color should have the same rights. That's what he pushed. Now, I know a lot of people, you know, Democrats want to say that, that uh, Martin Luther King was a Democrat and that he was a uh, that he was a socialist. Well, he wasn't a Democrat. He was a socialist. People want to uh, people on the Republican side want to take uh, King and say, well, he was a Republican. Well, he was a Republican, considering Democrats were all pro Jim Crow. But he was a socialist also. Well, how about this? How about we? Neither of us. Neither of that happens. He wasn't a leftist figure, and he wasn't a neoconservative figure. He was just a man who had an idea, and he pushed that idea in a peaceful way, and he changed our country, because that's what he did. But Martin Luther King only affected the last hundred years, or the hundred years. He only changed a hundred years of American history by eliminating Jim Crow, and he did not change the structure of the United States, the American experiment. He didn't want to change the American experiment. He wanted to add to it, and that's what he did. George Floyd, because his... I, I, to sit there and say his addition because of his life was to change the entire American experiment, to turn it completely upside down, he didn't do it on purpose, so I wouldn't say he contributed to American culture. He didn't. He was a thief. He was an armed robber. He was a drug addict. He was a terrible human being. I'm not going to miss him. He is more important because he could be the reason the entire American experiment ends. So Joe Biden, I hate to tell you, Joe Biden was probably right. Okay, so... Next story, which I, I did follow this story because I thought this was just a jack story. Uh, there was a hostage situation at a Jewish synagogue in Texas, Texas this weekend. The reaction from the FBI and White House is amazing. It probably shouldn't be anymore because this seems to be their typical response. But let's go over it. And then let's get to Ted Cruz because Ted Cruz proves what my theory proves what I am going to be pushing through this podcast. So here's the story. So on Saturday, 
which is a holy day for the Jews. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like Christian Sunday. Um, a man walked into the middle of a, the Jewish service at Beth Israel Synagogue in Colleyville, Texas. The Jews let him in because that's what they do. Turns out that religious pe- they thought he was a homeless man and they figured he wanted to get out of the cold. So they let him in um, because, like Christians, they have empathy for people who <coughs> they have empathy for people who are less fortunate. So that's what they do. Um, the man pulled a gun. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Freaking COVID. A gun that, by the way, he bought off the street illegally and held several people hostage, held the congregation hostage. Bunch of people actually got out before he was able to control the, the I'm going to call him a terrorist, but before the assailant assailant uh, got out and called, uh, assailant got control of the entire congregation. So a bunch of people got out. They called the police. The police and the FBI were were called and surrounded the building. The Texas SWAT team was also contacted and they showed up at the building. The FBI established communications with the man. Uh, His demand was that one of his religious sisters, this was something that was reported by the, this was something that was reported by the uh, media that it was his actual sister. No, he's his religious sister, just like um, in the Catholic Church and in uh, the Jewish church uh, synagogues. Uh, we're all fam- we're all brothers and sisters. It's the same thing here. Um, this gal who he wanted released was sentenced to eighty six years in prison, uh, and we'll get to her in a few minutes. The man was started live streaming. His this is important started live streaming his hostage uh, his hostage takeover. Um, he started screaming. He's not gonna. He, people are all gonna die. He's gonna die. He told us about his six kids, how he was married, and six beautiful kids. We'll get to those kids later because that's important too. And he was holding four of the hostages, including the rabbi. The rabbi, while the hostage taker was talking to the police, threw a chair at the man, hitting him, confusing him, and the four hostages escaped after escaped when the man was trying to get his bearings straight. This happened about six, seven hours after the hostage situation started. SWAT broke into the building, and according to reports, this cannot be confirmed yet. It may have been confirmed today, but I don't know. Um, the SWAT killed the suspect. By the way, the only reason I say we don't know if he killed himself or not is that we just don't really know. Chances are SWAT killed him, but who cares? The The guy was is a garbage human being to threaten to kill people while they're in church. He got what he deserved. So here, here's the big question. It's, it's the question we always ask, and it's usually the first question we ask after a situation is complete. Why did it happen? What happened? According to everyone, um, we don't really know. Uh, yeah, he live-streamed it. Yeah, it seems the reason why he did it was pretty obvious. But... You couldn't tell by listening to the President of the United States and the FBI. So here's the FBI talking about the motives of the suspect. And mind you, mind you, there's the dog. Mind you, he live streamed this. So this wasn't before the tech companies could actually shut him down. He was talking and we kind of knew what was going on. So here's the FBI. This is what the FBI had to say. Uh, we, we, we do believe from our engagement with this subject that he was singularly focused on one issue uh, and it was not specifically related to the Jewish community, uh, but we're continuing to work to find motive and, and we will continue on that path. That's right. The FBI had no idea. Oh, for all I knew, this guy was just cruising down the street and he came upon a Jewish synagogue and just decided to take hostages. Old Joe, hey, forget the fact that a lot of people actually saw the live stream. All right, and we're going to get to the motive in just a second. 
And apparently, these guys really need to consider getting themselves a subscription to the Daily Telegraph newspaper because they seem to have a pretty good idea what happened. Daily Telegraph, just by the way, is in England. It's I find it amazing that the FBI and the president didn't know why this guy was going in to attack, but a newspaper in England did. So here is um, here is FDF. Here's Joe Biden, old Joe, and you know he. This was going to be he's this poor bastard. He's just having a, such a rough time trying to get through his presidency. This guy may retire any minute now simply because he can't handle it. So this is what Joe Biden said. Well, no, I don't. We, we don't have, I, I don't think there is sufficient information to know about uh, why he targeted that synagogue, why he insisted on the release of someone who's been in prison for over uh, 10 years, why he was engaged, why he was uh, using anti-Semitic uh, and anti-Israeli comments. Uh, I, 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 we, we just don't have enough facts. He doesn't know why a guy w walked into a Jewish synagogue, started screaming anti-Semitic terms, asked for, well, we'll call it now, a known terrorist to be released from prison who is under an 86-year prison sentence? Really? You know, could I venture a guess? Maybe just this, some clues that I got. I mean, while the guy was in the hostage situation, he did stream the attack live. Okay. Well, here's the information I had during the attack. His name was Malik Fasil Ahram. The woman he wanted released was named Afia Sadiki, also known as Lady Al-Qaeda. According to ABC News correspondent Aaron Kastesky, quote, Afia Sadiki is linked to an al-Qaeda and was convicted in 2010 of attempting to kill Americans in Afghanistan. Sadiki, who's known in counterterrorism circles as Lady Al-Qaeda, has been linked to 911 ringleader, she was actually married to him, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and was once the FBI's most wanted, once on the most wanted terrorist list. Educated in the United States, she studied at MIT and received her doctorate from Brandis. Siddiqui was arrested in 2008 in Afghanistan carrying sodium cyanide, as well as documents describing how to make chemical weapons and dirty bombs and how to weaponize Ebola. When FBI and military officials tried to question Siddiqui, she grabbed a weapon left on a table in her interrogation room and fired upon them. Gee, do we still have no clue as to why this guy attacked the Jews? By the way, this came out while he was doing this. So I would pretty much assume that the FBI knew about this. But like I said, maybe maybe the FBI and Joe Biden should subscribe to the right-leaning British newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, because right after this whole thing ended, the Daily Telegraph listed a pretty substantial article about this Akram guy. So this is what we know. He's not an American. He was born, he, was, he lived in Blackburn, England. He may have been on the watch terror list, but no one will confirm whether he was on the British terror, terror list. When no one confirms it, that usually means he was. He got a tourist visa from the United States by lying about his identity on his application for the visa. He has a criminal history that dates back to 1996. He, there he was jailed for a disorder following a baseball attack on a member of his extended family. So he attacks one of his family members with a baseball bat. He was given a six-month custodial sentence, but was jailed again the following year for destru destruction of property. In 1999, he was again behind bars, convicted for harassment, and um, then being released on probation 
breached the terms of his release and was returned back to prison. In 2012, he was remanded into custody after being accused of stealing a cell phone and almost 5,000 pounds from a man in Chorley, England. Arkham has been a regular visitor to Pakistan and was understood to be a member of the Tablik Jamaat, an Islamic organization that has terrorist ties. So much so it was bound, banned. That group was banned in Saudi Arabia. And of course, like usual when it comes to terrorists, he's got a his family he's got a family history his family history is filled with mental illness. In other words, this guy was a terrorist. He should have never been allowed in the United States. There should have been red flags everywhere. Because he's a terrorist, he hates Jews and he wants to kill Jews. And he thought the best way to get this broad out of prison was to kill a bunch of Jews. If it wasn't for the fact that there was that brave rabbi, he probably would have killed those Jews and then killed himself. But that's not the most disturbing part of this whole story. What's disturbing about the story is identity politics and the victim class narrative is more important than the truth. For some reason, Muslims are seen as a victim class, and the left wants us to have more compassion for them than the Jews who are seen as an oppression class that they are attacking. We know this is true. Look at what's happening in Israel. I mean, they call the Jews, uh, uh, they call Israel a um, uh, apartheid state. And meanwhile, the real apartheid states are attacking Israel left and right. And they've been doing this for years. Jewish deaths mean nothing to the left. White deaths mean nothing to the left. The left does not care about the privileged or the oppressor classes. They can die, it's okay. But the, the, the thing, big thing is, that narrative has to survive, even if it means sacrificing the truth. Terrorism has become a political football. It's something the Biden administration didn't even want to deal with him. He's got enough failures to deal with that he doesn't need now we got terrorism in this country. Even though I'm not sure that Joe Biden actually believes that this is bad because, or not as bad because of identity politics, I don't think he's hiding this because of identity politics. I think he's hiding this because he just doesn't need any more terrorists, doesn't need any issue, more issues than he already has. What, with the bad borders, the inflation, the crisis, the um, uh, supply chain crisis, the foreign policy disasters, now he's going to have to deal with uh, terrorism on the homeland? I think that's what he's really thinking about. This also shows the government how much, how much the government sucks at what they do. This guy should have never been in the country. He should have never been in the country. This guy, he had to turn in an application. Okay, did was he vetted? Obviously, this guy was not vetted because he was just allowed in. He was given a visa to come in. And this guy got a visa to come into New York City and then got a, his visa updated to go to Texas. So this guy had to deal with the government not once but twice. And the government never thought to, okay, let's check this guy out. And of course, Joe Biden's blaming, they're blaming gun control and things because this guy had a gun, which by the way, he illegally bought. That is a narrative that's going nowhere and everyone knows it. Why are we trusting the government? And finally, there's the FBI. The FBI has been completely corrupted because of politics. They are no longer the unbiased law enforcement arm. By the way, the largest law enforcement arm in the United States. They are no longer that. They are now biased. They are the strong arm of the Democratic Party. They're becoming the strong arm of the left. Because that's what the left does. They, they infect everything. I mean, they're doing it with the military now. That's probably what my, uh, what my podcast, what my video cast is going to be about later. They're infecting everything. And if you don't believe me, let's take a look at January 6th. 
Now, Ted Cruz, and this was something I was going to do last week, but I was reviewing Joe Biden's speech, and this is going to go long too. But I was reviewing Joe Biden's speech, and there was so much in that speech that was so disgusting, I actually skipped this. But I can't skip it, because it proves that the FBI is really jacked up. So let's go into some topics here. And this is this is from last this is from what I was going to tell you. But Ted Cruz got lambasted about two weeks ago because he called the January 6th rioters rioters terrorists. Basically playing into the democratic narrative. I thought the comment was not good, but I didn't put too much into it. And I didn't want Ted Cruz demonized because he he used clumsy language. And yes, it was clumsy language. I don't believe that's what he meant. I believe he just used clumsy language. Uh, needless to say, the right did start attacking him. Tucker Tucker Carlson did not give him much of a break. He ripped Ted Cruz. Hear the doggy? Hear the doggy? Um, he ripped Ted Cruz to the point that Ted Cruz realized, oh my God, I've got allies at Fox News, and now they're pissed at me. So he decided to go and 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 let Tucker rip him, and he did. Cruz sucked it up. He said he it was clumsy, stupid language, and he didn't mean what he said. And of course, the the left wing media they played this over, and Ted Cruz is a coward. Blah blah blah. Who cares, right? And one of the things Tucker pointed out was that. Ted Cruz is a master of language, and he is. This is a man who's argued in front of the Supreme Court. He is a master of language. He is fantastic at it. The thing is, so how could this happen? Well, here's the whole thing. Um, Sometimes it happens. He may be a master at language. That doesn't mean every word that comes out of his mouth is going to be a good word. Give him a break. I'm going to give him a break. Of the one bad thing that this guy has actually said, <coughs> I'm going to give him a break on it and say he didn't mean it. And he comes on television and says, listen, it was bad language. I shouldn't have said it. And he had the balls to face the music with Tucker Carlson. Well, I don't call what the left said, where they called him a coward because he changed his stance. I don't call that cowardice. I call it bravery to face your people and say, yeah, I, I effed up. Good for him. So I will always give um, Tucker, I will always give Ted Cruz the benefit of the doubt until he really does something that's out there. So we'll have to see. But here's the thing. He made up for it that very same week, last week, where he faced a couple of directors, one from the FBI and one from the DOJ, And he completely invalidated the January 6th commission, which is that, quote, bipartisan, end quote, commission trying to figure out what happened on January 6th. You know, that one we talked about where, you know, we basically know already because there have already been two reports released and it's not bipartisan. You've got nothing but Democrats and the only two Republicans are rhinos. They're actually not Republicans. They're Democrats. Um. He tore into these people, and he really raised a lot of questions. So let's take a look at this. And I know I'm going long today, but I think this is important to see what kind of BS our DOJ and our FBI actually are and how corrupted they are. So in this first clip, Cruz goes after Assistant Attorney General of the DOJ, Matthew Olson. Listen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Olson, how many people have been charged with crimes of violence in connection with the events on January 6th? Senator, I'm not sure exactly how many uh, have been charged with crimes of violence. I know that there are okay. many. How, how many have been charged with nonviolent crimes? I don't have the numbers of people charged, whether at the state or federal level. I know that okay. there how are. How many people are currently incarcerated concerning the events of January 6th? I don't know the number of people incarcerated. Again, I know that I, How I many do people, have, Okay, let me ask you that. Look, we have right. limited time, so I don't want you to filibuster. You either know the answer or you don't. How many people have been placed in solitary confinement concerning the events of January 6th? I don't have any information about that, Senator. 
You know, Mr. B Olson, I will say it was sad. Senator Lee just asked you about this. Back in June of 2021, Senator Lee and I and two other senators sent a letter to the Department of Justice asking these questions, asking about the differential prosecutions. Let me ask you, during 2020, Black Lives Matter and Antifa riots all across the country, there were over 700 police officers injured by Black Lives Matter and Antifa riots. How many people have been charged with crimes of violence concerning those riots all across the country? I don't have information on how many. I, I would say, you know, hundreds of people have been charged. As, as Ms. You, you would say, but, but you don't know. OK, just a review. Olson is testifying in front of the Senate about January 6th. He is an assistant district deputy attorney for the DOJ. How could he not have this information? How could he not know that Republicans were going to ask these questions? Well, the reality is he did know. He just didn't want to answer the questions. So the best way to handle it is to feign lack of knowledge. Because they would rather sit back and, and say, well, I have no idea, than they would give an answer and it's the wrong answer. Or give an answer, which is worse, it's the right answer. Okay, here Cruz points out that the FBI and DOJ has become a strong arm of the Biden administration, doling out justice in, un, in, unequally. And this is a real problem. Now, he intimated this in his last question. But here he goes out and basically says it. You know, when we asked you why the Biden Department of Justice has such wildly disparate standards going after January 6th, targeting some people who committed crimes of violence and anyone who commits a crimes of, of violence should be prosecuted, but also targeting a lot of nonviolent individuals, we asked you why is it that you won't target the rioters and terrorists who firebomb cities across this country. The answer we got from the Department of Justice was shameful. On October 22nd, you came back and said, quote, the department has dedicated investigative and prosecutorial resources commensurate with the significance of these events. By significance, I guess it means the political benefit to the Biden White House. And I will tell you, there are a great many Americans who are understandably deeply concerned about the politicization of the Department of Justice under President Joe Biden. It has been 218 days since we sent you that letter. DOJ refused to answer the letter today when Senator Lee and I asked you about it. Your answer to every damn question is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You're under oath. You may believe at the Department of Justice that you are unaccountable to the American people, but that is not the case. And the wildly disparate standards are unacceptable. Ms. Sandberg. Everything he said was correct. I'll go, this, I'll go a step further. Barack Obama did the same thing. Where do you think Joe Biden learned this? He didn't learn that. He didn't come up with this on his own. He's not that smart. He learned this from Barack Obama federalizing or politicizing the DOJ and the FBI. Well, in this next clip, clip uh, Cruz goes after the FBI's executive assistant director for the National Security Branch, Jill Sandborg. He has no less, he is no less brutal to her. Doesn't matter if she's a woman. He, he went right after her. And she, her, I think her testimony is the most telling. I want to turn to the FBI. How many FBI agents or confidential informants actively participated in the events of January 6th? Sir, I'm sure you can appreciate that I can't go into the specifics of sources and methods. Uh, Did any the, FBI agents any FBI or agents confidential or informants confidential actively informants participate, participate in the events of January 6th? Events yes, January or no? 6th. yes or no? Sir, I can't, I can't answer that. Did any FBI agents or confidential informants commit crimes of violence on January 6th? I can't answer that, sir. Did any FBI agents any FBI or FBI informants actively encourage and incite crimes of violence on January 6th? Sir, I can't answer that. This is incredible testimony. What do you mean you can't answer it? You can't say no? 
to any of those questions? You can't say no? We can, I, I can, we, we can really assume that the answer to those, those answers is yes, because there is nothing accountable. There are no consequences to saying no. There is a consequence to saying no, and then later we find out she lied. She could be in prison. This is incredible testimony that nobody covered. Well, Tucker Carlson covered covered it. And Tucker Carlson said this redeemed him, and I think it truly did. It's absolutely incredible. Okay, now let's listen to Cruz finish her off. Ms. Sadburn, Ms. Who is Ray Epps? I'm aware of the individual, sir. Uh, I don't have the specific background to him. Okay, Ray Epps. You may have heard of this guy before, but he is a legend with conspiracy theorists. Except he actually was there. He isn't a conspiracy. We know he was there. We know he was pushing people to go into the Capitol building on January 6th. He was filmed. His words were filmed. A bunch of people who were at January 6th said that he was an FBI agent. It's all on film. Are you getting the impression that some of these conspiracy theorists are probably not saying any... What they're saying is not a conspiracy that... That there, it's not a theory that these are actual conspiracies of the U.S. government. That some of this is probably true. That Ray Epps, and I'm going to let Cruz tell you, basically come up with Ray Epps, that Ray Epps may have actually worked with the FBI. And let's be clear, she won't answer again. She doesn't deny it. She just won't answer. So... I mean, it's just absolutely fantastic. Suddenly, what is the saying? I, just because I believe in, just because I'm, just because I believe in conspiracy theories and am paranoid doesn't mean that people aren't following me. Maybe those conspiracy theorists, they're not paranoid, and they're not conspiracy theorists. Maybe they're getting it right this time. Okay, so let's listen to Cruz absolutely destroy her right here. And she has no answer, or can answer. Who knows? Well, there are a lot of well, people who are understandably very are concerned, about, very Mr. concerned about, Mr. Epps. about Mr. Epps. On the night of January 5th, 2021, Epps wandered around the crowd that had gathered. And there's video out there of him chanting, tomorrow, we need to get into the Capitol, into the Capitol. This was strange behavior, so strange that the crowd began chanting, fed, 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 fed. Ms. Sandburn, was Ray Epps a Fed? Sir, I cannot answer that question. The next day. The next day. On January 6th, Mr. Epps is seen whispering to a person, and five seconds later, five seconds after he's whispering to a person, that same person begins to forcibly tear down the barricades. Did Mr. Epps urge them to tear down the barricades? Sir, similar to the other answers, I cannot answer that. Shortly thereafter, the FBI put out a public post listing, seeking information on individuals connected with violent crimes on January 6th. Among those individuals in the bottom there is Mr. Epps. The FBI publicly asked for information, identifying, offering cash rewards leading to information, leading to, for information leading to the arrest. This was posted, and then, sometime later, magically, Mr. Epps disappeared from the public posting. According to public records, Mr. Epps has not been charged with anything. No one's excha- explained why a person videoed urging people to go to the Capitol, a person whose conduct was so suspect the crowd believed he was a Fed, would magically disappear from the list of people the FBI was looking at, Ms. Sandburn, a lot of Americans are concerned that the federal government deliberately encouraged illegal and violent conduct 
on January 6th. My question to you, and this is, a, this is not an ordinary law enforcement question, this is a question of a public accountability. Did federal agents or those in service of federal agent actively encourage violent and criminal conduct on January 6th? Not to my knowledge, sir. That is incredible testimony. And you know something? None of these questions were asked in the January 6th committee. None. The conspiracy doesn't look like, the conspiracy looks like it might be true, not just the theory anymore. It sounds like the conspiracy is being perpetuated by the Democrats, by the Biden administration, by the DOJ, by the FBI. And they're hiding it. And they're not hiding it well. Well, good for Ted Cruz. And I know this was a long podcast, but I couldn't skip this. Especially looking at how the FBI is trying to hide terrorist activity. Basically saying the same thing Joe Biden said. When it was so obviously terrorism. Okay, visit my website at dumbassestalkingpolitics.com. Don't forget to go check out Rumble. At rumble.com, type in a search for Dumbasses Talking Politics and take a look at the videos. I'm going to release a couple of other videos that are just absolutely incredible um, this week. Well, I mean, what I'm going to be talking, my videos are, I'm not incredible, but the uh, videos themselves that I'm going to show you are just incredible. Uh, I hope you have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow, and I swear to God, it'll be a lot shorter tomorrow. This is Gene. You've listened to Dumbasses Talking Politics.